Another harrowing tale of utter brutality, this story plumbs the depths of darkness contained in the human psyche, which begins inside of a steampunk dream of sorts. Outside of the death and miserable conditions, this was from back when you didn't kill a man face to face with lead and steel, but by dousing them in caustic elements from above, like a coward. The war machine produces a daily massacre that fills the medical tents with buckets of blood and sloppy amputations. When the surgeon goes in to extract a handful of foreign bodies, he withdraws an interesting artifact that is very much unlike the others. This transports us to some rich prick's estate where a handsome woman named Charlotte waits solemnly and flashes us back to her childhood with her brother Edward, as he gets in little tease. Isabel is the lady of the house and Seamus is the lord. Exercising dominance on these fools, by hunting their dinner and whipping open any door he wants without knocking. Out on the back 40, we find a covered wagon train pulling in to set up camp, put down roots, and spread the beauty of Romanian culture. This includes the smelting of silver to adorn a decorative jaw. It's a profoundly important ritual. It is pretty freaking rad. That night, Charlie and Ed go snooping about and hear the elder men conspiring over the matter of the new encampment occupying their shared lands. Given the occupiers have a legitimate claim and have rejected a reasonable offer to vacate, they take the next best step of hiring mercenaries to run them off with force. Bright and early, one fine morning shortly thereafter, we witness the old English classic phalanx of torch-wielding mobsters. They've come to parlay forcefully to demonstrate the necessity of submitting to cash offers. But these lot are not eager to abandon their ancestral lands, so the talks quickly spiral into an unmitigated massacre. In the aftermath, we find few survivors and much juvality. These God-fearing Englishmen don't take kindly to their customs of heretical magic. So when in the midst of their celebrations, the matron of the black arts puts a hex on them and all their kin, they respond by making an example for any that may find their way back to the these lands by putting up a scarecrow. She is less ceremoniously addressed. Back at the house, it seems that Charlotte may have gone hard on some expired salted pork because her dreams are wild. On that same night, we find old John McBride sidling up and seeking a room. He has been on the trail of some travelers and claims to be a pathologist, whatever that means during this time period. As he partakes in the standard hospitality, he's joined by his old friend Alfred, the lieutenant, who wants to kind of feel out his business here. Meanwhile, Edward is enticed by the allure of the wilderness to go inspect the new scarecrow. He also paws at the dark magic. Now, if his vision of the crone is a dream, it's more ambiguous, because he wakes in a fright out on the front lawn. Not a good sign for the local kids, if you ask me. Later on, out in the common area with the Pavels, Timmy suggests the youngsters use their tea break to go see something cool. He leads them to a little clearing with the familiar scarecrow and is able to confirm that ever since the night of the fire, they've all been having dreams about the scarecrow and the silver teeth. What the normies don't understand is that young Timothy was born in the dark, so he has no fear of what may come from disturbing these hollowed grounds. This proves to be ill-informed as he is compelled through an invisible force to don the teeth and attack the progeny of his benefactors. The screams of the children draw immediate attention and they soon bring Edward back to the house to await the doctor. He struggles to breathe and the doctor prescribes some antibiotics and morphine. He wants to let that settle in over the next couple of days. Due to the oath of silence the children took, the adults believe the culprit to have been a wild animal, which is partly true because your boy Timmy is a beast. After waking to another dream of malcontent, Charlotte goes to ease her mind by checking on Edward, but finds him writhing under the throes of puberty. Seamus heeds her call, but they find the young boy to have alighted from this place. An immediate search party is formed, but they come back empty-handed. In town, deep in his studies, John is interrupted by Alfred. He's been called to the manor for an investigation and seeks the help of his old friend due to the potential involvement of pathogens or black magic. Later at church, Timmy summons Charlotte over to the confessional. We learn that he remembers nothing about what happened and is horrified to learn about the attack in light of the implications it will have for his family maintaining residence here. To try to fix things, he's brought the teeth to the church to keep them contained on holy ground. When he's discovered, he runs off in shame, and then, when he observes the subject of his disgrace, he takes off toward Edward, hoping that he can rectify his mistake. He is unable to locate Edward from above the sightline of the tall grasses, which results in him getting his arm chunked up something 
and fierce. From here, he retreats to a nearby shed for a final confrontation. When John and Alfred finally arrive, they are notified that the situation has escalated since they were first summoned. They trudge out into the misty woods where Timmy's remains were recently found. Alfred can't stay in his company, but John, having a greater composure and more robust disposition, is able to gather some evidence and do some inspecting. He concludes that the wounds are consistent with being attacked by a wolf. And this is all Alfred needed to hear, is you can't litigate nature. So he's ready to wrap it up, as they have enough to deal with due to the broader cholera outbreak happening at that time. John, suspecting something else resides below the surface, would like to stay on for a few days and see what he can dig up. After being brought up to speed, he does a thorough examination of the house, recommending they board up the lower level windows as a precaution. As he continues to gather evidence, he finds himself drawn to the teeth and other secrets hiding in the soil. He's even granted visions of his loving family being graciously invited to the afterlife. Which was, of course, a dream. The next night, we find John gathering a sample for a DNA test. Not only do the blood cells look funky under magnification, but when he revitalizes them, his own blood is consumed. He is then attracted to a noise down the hall and finds a little critter scratching at the door. He and Seamus venture out but find nothing. Nonetheless, John indicates that a hunt is in order and recommends no one travel the grounds without the protection of an armed guard. Under these circumstances, the elders gather to discuss the blight that's befallen them. John recommends they also board up and hunker down, for now. There is precedent for this in the exploits of the Beasts of Javadon, but they can only compel a military intervention if they have hard evidence. And since it's been a while for us, since there's been a feast of flesh, we learn that the servants are still performing their tasks based on a short straw drawing system. In this case, the absolutely vital chore of picking up sticks. Callum thinks he hears something and ventures off into the woods alone, violating best safety practices for serfs. Anne-Marie then finds Jacob taking a nap, but in an uncharacteristic way, as he is usually nude when splayed out upon barbed wire. His body is being disturbed by some freaky creature that then leaps up and gives her a little nibble. Callum then returns and his presence provides enough distraction to allow her to flee and raise the alarm. In the aftermath, all they find are a few tough pieces of boot leather, but no signs of the dragon she claims attacked them. John quickly goes to examine the victim, but upon arrival, they find that she's taken leave and returned to the wilderness. John recommends everyone hole up in the church, only leaving to fetch food and water under armed guard. He warns them to try to limit their exposure, but to what? The answer lies with Anne-Marie, who desperately seeks water to feed the entrails now blooming from her various cracks and crevices. In a quiet moment, John reveals that he was present at Shevadon when a similar affliction befell them. His wife and daughter were counted among the victims. In the pursuit of his vengeance against the pathogenic curse, he traveled west until the trail went cold, and now, it seems, he's found his opportunity to eradicate it. Seamus is of a similar mind regarding their goal, but remains skeptical about the curse aspect of their situation. <laughs> I mean, how can someone as innocent as he become victim of a curse? The next day, John goes to lay his traps. He happens upon the wretched sight of his dreams, but he cannot tarry long for he intends to dig a massive tiger pit. He wakes suddenly from a deep sleep after a hard dig to find he is not alone. While he did not intend to bait the trap with himself, it does happen to work out that way. Now it's time for the boys to get busy, and they all sit back and observe as John hacks away at the beast's carcass. Inside, they find Anne-Marie, emerging from her greasy cocoon and seeking a new host, so they put her down. Now about that curse. That's absurd. But look at what just happened, my dude. But Seamus insists that he's the one who's been wrong, so the curse should go the other way. And if John can't get on board with that, so be it. He'll rid his property of the pest on his own. Things are so bad, even the long-term help is leaving. But who will raise and love the children? Isabel now comes clean about the mass grave and what the menfolk have been up to. Given the circumstances, Charlotte now also decides to break her oath and explain about Timmy and the teeth. They quickly rush out to retrieve them from the church. This 
evidence is hard enough to warrant John putting out a call for a garrison. He also visits a blacksmith so they may melt the silver back down again and form it into bullets. Meanwhile, Anise is still diligently tending to the wash completely alone. The obvious problem here is that the completely predictable outcome negates all of her hard work. Luckily, the bang dogs of the hunting party grant her an opportunity to escape, although her body does have some significant gaps now. Seamus eventually returns from his hunt empty-handed, but at least finds some semblance of normalcy in eating dinner with his surviving family members while served by loyal Anise. She moves among them like a ghost, barely able to stand, while out front, John is setting up the yard like a driving range for guns, before finding evidence of the earlier attack. But he runs inside and finds everyone accounted for, so they all settle into their evening routines. But Seamus senses a disturbance, a feminine moaning wafting in from somewhere inside the manor. He gets his gun and follows the sound upstairs. Through the process of elimination, he's found the source of the sounds, but is not able to prevent Denise from gnawing on him a little bit. He is able to pop her head open, but in the struggle, the damn candles catch the whole ass house on fire. Isabel is sent to retrieve Charlotte while John pursues Seamus, who he finds ready to now accept his responsibility for the events that have transpired. To that end, he takes steps to ensure he'll not infect anyone with his curse in a very stylish manner. Inside, the ladies are blocked from leaving by the approaching beast Edward, and their response to his presence I miss Edward. casts some doubt on the integrity of Charlotte's earlier statements. When the coast is clear, they glide down the stairs and meet up with John. The trio flees amidst the pandemonium of what must feel like the end of days. And just beyond the tree line, they discover that Nana didn't make it very far. They're also pinned down when Edward catches up to their position. However, he doesn't do more than play a little peekaboo with John. He smells the silver and doesn't want the smoke, so they continue toward the church with Edward shrieking like a banshee the whole way. Once there, John's able to convince them to avoid any hasty action until morning's light, when their chances will be more favorable. But in the night, a labored wailing draws Isabel to the door, and when the screams take on a distinctly Edwardian tone, it sends her into a door-opening frenzy. The chaos that ensues makes it very difficult to get off a clean shot, but Isabel does manage to command a reprieve. The angle forces John to take the double kill, which is bad, but it does still afford her one last moment with her gooey boy. Flashbacks then jarringly remind us that we started in a completely different movie and reveal that the dead fellow from the opening was Edward as a grown man. The silver bullet had been lodged inside of him all this time, keeping the curse at bay. And once free of the curse, the kids went to live with John and they enjoyed a long, full life together. Until now! My immediate thought is that they pulled the bullet out, causing Edward to regenerate into a werewolf. Charlotte, armed with knowledge and silver bullets, has to hunt him down. Boom! Instant sequel. If that wasn't too much for you, be sure to check out this video next. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.